Yeah. What, what is who? Who are the iGen generation? iGen are people uh, born 1995 or after. Um, and it, it, it basically Jean Twenge is a, a generational expert. That's what her whole career has been looking at differences between generations. And she saw a really dramatic discontinuity between millennials and people born after 1995. And that's actually a really good way to figure out you know where generations starting to begin is by looking at surveys and all that all that kind of stuff. Um, in her book, she uh, thinks that a lot of the and we're one thing that we found out that was you know really kind of horrifying in, in the early research for the book was that while we had kind of assumed that there was going to be um, an increase in anxiety and depression on campuses, because like we argued in our original article, we're teaching a generation the habits of anxious and depressed people, so we shouldn't be we shouldn't <laughs> be surprised that they're anxious anxious and depressed. But when the numbers finally came in, and you know uh, when John looked at them, they were much much worse. Yeah, I, I just read this. This is the the stat of the book that made me audibly yell out and, and when I was reading it. Uh, a 2016 report by the Center for Collegiate Mental Health using data from 139 colleges found that by the 2015-2016 school year, half of all students surveyed reported having attended counseling for mental health concerns. That is shocking. Uh, and and oh, did, I, did you oh, see that, that too, that's, John? That's nothing. We can see much for shocking stats. <laughs> but, you, know, cause, you know, because that could be just that, um, just that this young generation is much more comfortable about talking about mental health. That could be a good thing. So there was an article in the New York Times two weeks ago by Richard Friedman, a psychiatrist, who said, don't worry, there's no anxiety epidemic. Screens aren't rotting your kids' brains. Uh, you know, here's the biggest survey done in 2012 shows no change. Well, yeah, in 2012, there was no change. And then he says, and, you know, there are a couple of surveys that uh, show that a recent increase, but those are just based on self-report and students are more comfortable talking about it. So it doesn't mean anything. Well, we thought about that long and hard. We looked really hard at the data because we didn't want to foment a moral panic. And the two pieces of evidence that really convinced us that this is real and serious are a study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association that found it looked at hospital admissions. These are kids who were admitted to hospital for harming their bodies to the point where they had to be hospitalized. They weren't, it wasn't fatal and, and they often weren't, they usually were not suicide attempts, but it's, you know, cutting yourself and, uh, with sharp objects, things like that. Uh, and the rates are up, they're way, way up for uh, girls ages 10 to 14. They're up substantially for girls 15 to 19. They're not up for boys and they're not up for girls over 20. So it is unique to um, iGen, to the basically to the kids who were teenagers when social media came out, or when they when they largely got on at around 2010, 2011, 2012 is when there's the big uptake. So it, hospital admissions for self harm are way up, and that is not self report. And most alarmingly, suicide is up, and that's for both sexes. So uh, if you look at the last two years of data. Uh, uh, for boys and girls, uh, teenage boys and girls, what we find is that the rate for boys is up 25 percent uh, from the average of the first decade of this century, the average 20, 2001 to 2010, 25 percent up for boys. That is huge. The increase for girls is 70 percent, seven zero. So this is not an illusion of self-report. This is a, a tidal wave of anxiety and depression leading to self-harm, hospital admissions and suicide. So and uh, so one of the causal uh, uh, so we talk about six causal, causal threads um, and we talk about anxiety and depression, but in two distinct chapters, one on polarization, which we also think is part of the reason why all of this is sped up. We think polarization, particularly echo chambers, really speed speed this up and reward tribalistic behavior. But social media does play a role in both speeding up polarization, but also um, for depression and anxiety. And we agree with Twangy that that the the numbers are quite convincing that there's a correlation there. Just just the core, but it just doesn't explain enough of the variance for um, uh, depression uh, and anxiety. That which is why we do actually assume that excessive social media use, particularly for these sort of social comparison websites, can be very harmful to you know particularly young people's um, uh, happiness. And the way I put it for people who, who look at me skeptically when I say this, I, I say, imagine being in uh, the worst aspects of junior high school, twenty four hours a day. Forever. <laughs> does that does that sound nice to anybody? So those yeah, are you can't, you can't even get away on weekends when you're home with your parents, or, or and people don't get uh, you know they're still on their smartphones at two o'clock in the morning too, which doesn't which doesn't help. So those are the first two causal threads. Do you want to talk about the other ones, John? 
Yeah, sure. Just wait, before we get off this, I just, um, Lenore Skenazy, the, who wrote Free Range Kids, she just sent me an amazing stat this morning from a, a survey just published in the UK. Because the UK is just about six months or a year behind us. Um, they're having the same events on campus. I thought the time difference was uh, more like six hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, they're they're having the same uh, issues of rising anxiety and depression among teenagers and especially girls. So here's a, a survey found uh, finds sharp decline in happiness of young women and girls. And nestled within all the statistics is this: um, in other ways, however, girls' lives appear to have contracted as their world moves online. In 2009, 69 percent of girls met friends at each other's houses, compared with 21 percent in 2018. So think about that. You know, in junior high school or early high school, you'd go over to a friend's house, you'd go play. They don't do that anymore. They, most of them do not, after school, they see each other at school. When they go home, they sit in their room and they're on social media. So imagine what this does to developing social skills. Imagine what this does in a world that is getting physically safer and safer, but kids are immersed more and more in an online world where anonymous people can make threats that are never acted on as far as I know, but are scary. So this is a big part of the problem. And so we talked to the six uh, ways of leading up to this. We're kind of going backwards here, but I think it works. Is we'll get to the three untruths, but w w if we set the stage with here's a generation and here's what happened to them, and then we bring them into college, and we'll, we'll get to that. But so we have uh, anxiety, depression, parenting practices, and play. Would you like to talk about that, John? Sure. Um, so, the, so the main thing we're trying to explain is this rapid change in 2014 that Greg noticed and that became really, really clear in the year or two after we published the Atlantic article. Why did things change so quickly? And we identify six causes. Um, and so two of them are about changes in parenting. So one is paranoid parenting. That is the idea that um, uh, so until the idea that if you the world's dangerous for kids and if my kids are ever outside without me or another designated adult watching them, they will be kidnapped. Or at least there's a, such a high risk of being, them being kidnapped that it is worth me not letting them out. It is worth me depriving them of freedom um, to, to remove this microscopic chance that they will be kidnapped. And this happened because of cable TV. There were a few highly publicized uh, uh, killings of of, of of young children, Aton Pates and then Adam Walsh especially. Um, so in the 80s, that kind of gears up. But it's not until the 90s that uh, that kids seem to have been, uh, that, that the new idea came out that if you let your kids walk to school or play in a park, you're a negligent parent. And it's not until the early 2000s that we hear the first reports of parents being arrested because their kids were caught playing in a park unsupervised. So the change in childhood um, comes in gradually uh, in, the, in the 1990s. Kids learn of stranger danger. The world is threatening. Uh, and so, sure, they're, they're more afraid now. That's part of it. Uh, so that's the paranoid parenting. Related to that is the loss of free play. And this, we think, this was the most interesting and exciting thing that we learned that was new to us. Yeah, it was a really fun chapter to write. Um, it's that, ma well, mammals play. We all know that. Um, I was walking through Washington Square Park the other day in New York City, and I was walking by the playground where all the toddlers played. It was really cute to see them running around and screaming and rolling and tumbling and laughing. And then, and then 50, you know, 100 yards further on, there's this small dog playground. And it was really cute to see the small dogs <laughs> running and tumbling and rolling and playing and laughing. And you, know, um, and you really get, you really see, wow, this is what mammals need to do. This is what young mammals need to do. They need to wrestle and play and run and test each other. Um, mammals practice chasing games, play, uh, tag to prepare for either being prey or predators. So in all kinds of ways, play builds the mind. The, the human brain is designed to be completed long, long after birth, and play is what completes that wiring. Well, what happened in America, and also the UK, it turns out, um, as we got more paranoid, we didn't let our kids out, and then we also went insane for early academics. We got this ridiculous idea that uh, if our kids listen to Mozart, they'll be smarter. If our kids learn fractions in first grade, they'll be smarter than if they wait till third grade. Let's push everything earlier. Let's see, what should we kick out? Well, recess and art, we don't need those things. They won't help you get into college. So the loss of play, uh, we believe, is one of the biggest reasons why kids who are play deprived find interpersonal conflicts very, very hard to resolve. They don't have the skills, so they run to HR and then they refuse to come to the meeting where they have to face <laughs> the person who made a joke. Yeah, and I, I love how you cite, cite Steve Horowitz, who's a friend and has been on Free Thoughts before, to talk about some of these things, and especially the difference between formal and informal play, and how it helps to you can 
create a basketball game or something. And this is what I did. And I imagine this is what Greg and John, you guys did too. You get a, a bunch of kids of different ages playing a game that's unstructured without anyone supervising. It's not Little League. It's a pickup oh, baseball sure, yeah. game, right? And you have to figure out how to adjust because there's a six-year-old playing with some 10-year-olds. Uh -huh. and, and you work on a way to, to work them into the game, you know, and make sure. And that's all organic. And, and that's really, really good. And you can't run to, I mean, sometimes you'll, someone will run home to mom, which is a, a kind of what John was saying about HR, because that's the old saying, right? Yeah. Why don't you run home to mom and tell mommy? It's and a bad a, thing. And that's a rule violation. You're shamed <laughs> for doing that. You yeah. learn not to do it. You and, learn to work it out. And yeah. now, and now it seems to be what they're doing uh, a, a lot more. Well, one of the things for, for me from a personal standpoint well, um, that was really interesting, actually, the, the, cha the, parent, the, the chapters on parenting were two, I think, for both of us, two of our favorite chapters to, to research and read, partially because it was an opportunity for both to learn things that we didn't necessarily know going in. And partially, since neither of us are parenting experts, we uh, interviewed our friend Lenore Skenazy, we interviewed Erica Christakis, and Julie Lefkat hames who wrote a book called How to Raise an Adult. And the thing that really stuck in my head was, um, you you know, Erica Christakis's work is pr practically screaming. Kids need unstructured time, period. They need more of it. And they need more unsupervised play and really hitting you over the head with how how well established this is. And this uh, and I, I have a I have a nine month old and I have a, th uh, a nearly three year old. And so I live, you know, I live on the hill where the, the, it's definitely sort of a bastion of, of, of sort of agro parents. And I'm like, wow, this is – if this is really what, what, what we're saying um, and, and what the research actually says, no parent I know is actually – they're doing the exact opposite of, of all of this stuff, which was really uh, uh, really profound to me. So when I try to explain it to like, other parents like in the, in the preschool group, they're like, oh, OK. Yeah, we need more uh, unsupervised time. But uh, so how do I help them uh, you, you know, do that? I'm like, no, no, that's, not, that's exactly the opposite of what we're saying and it just isn't sticking. Schedule two hours of unsupervised time yeah. between this period and this period. Go forth and be fun. Highly moderated by parents, of course. <laughs> no, but actually, but actually, that would be fine if they scheduled it. It was called recess. True. And the True. playground monitor was inside. So yeah. if someone gets hurt, you know where to go. Yeah. But, you know, at my kids' school, when my kids go to New York City public schools, and there's a playground monitor who's right there. No running. Someone could get hurt. No running. If anyone cries, he comes over. And, and so what kids are learning is called moral dependency. If there's a conflict, they learn to be dependent. You have to go to the authority to work it out. And so this is the, exactly the opposite of how you would train young people for college, for democracy, or for employment. 